whilst Debian is in the process of sort of half dropping 32-bit support, be sure to check out that prior video. Ubuntu is over here messing around with what they're doing with 64-bit support. So recently they released a blog post called Optimizing Ubuntu Performance on AMD64 Architecture. Now like what is often done with i386, where it's used to reference everything up to i686, the same is true over on the x64 or x8664 side. In a modern context, when we say x8664, it doesn't really refer to a single architecture. Nowadays, it's been broken down into various levels. Here's an example. In 2022, the Ryzen 7600X released. In 2004, the Athlon 64 3600 Plus released. Now, both of these are x86-64 CPUs. Both of these use a 64-bit instruction set, but they don't have the exact same features. The Ryzen CPU runs x86-64 V4, whereas the Athlon only has the V1 functionality. So then, by far and away the most used architecture for Ubuntu is AMD64, also known as x86-64 in some contexts. Ubuntu is still built for the very first AMD64 CPUs, the AMD K8 from 2003, that's where the Athlon came from, it came a little bit after that initial release, and Intel 64-bit Prescott from 2004, using the original instruction set architecture. And that's not just an Ubuntu thing, that is true for the vast majority of 64-bit distros. There are a couple of exceptions when you get into the enterprise space, but on the desktop, if you have a 20-year-old CPU, and that's a 64-bit CPU, you can probably still just run the distro, although it might be a bit slow. But over the years, things have changed. AMD and Intel have added a number of extensions. SIMD, SSE3, SSE4, AVX, AVX512. If you pay attention to modern tech news, you've probably at least heard the phrases AVX and AVX512. Special purpose, RDRAND, AESNI, VNNI. Slightly more general, CMPX, CHG16B. I'm not even going to pretend like I know what this is. Atomic Compare and Exchange. VFMADD. Fused Multiply Add for Floating Point. MOVBE. Byte Order Conversion. I'm sure all of these probably deserve a video unto themselves. The point is, the CPUs from 20 years ago don't have the same features the CPUs today have. The layman explanation, they make the CPU do new things, and do new things quicker than old things. Whether it's handling more data at once, or better handling floating point numbers and things like that, when we are considering such a low level here, that being your CPU, when so many of these operations are taking place, any little improvement is going to make a massive overall improvement. Not using these new instructions to improve performance throughout the distribution seems like a missed opportunity. A few core packages like libc and OpenSSL do runtime detection to use newer instructions when they're available, but vastly more packages do no such thing. Now this whole breaking it down to levels thing is actually a really new concept. Before this, CPUs basically just released and they had like a mix and match these features and you could check each individual CPU to know which features they had, but it wasn't entirely clear what features were going to be there. But they realized that there were often features that got paired together. So in 2020, the Glibc developers, particularly Florian Weimer of Red Hat, got sufficiently fed up with this mess to propose a solution on the Libc alpha mailing list. Assemble reasonable sets of CPU features into levels that are mostly, very important about this part, mostly supported together and have the dynamic loader search directories based on these names. Here is that announcement if you want to know the full details and how it all went down, but it's not particularly relevant to what we're talking about today. So after some bike shedding, which happens with any sort of these discussions, four levels were defined, each including the previous V1 or baseline, V2, V3, and V4, and these definitions were added to the PSABI specification Roughly speaking, the document that defines what binary code for an AMD64 Linux system looks like. And these right here are what the four levels look like. If you want to check out each of the individual features, feel free to do that. But 
just know that these are what is present. But the problem is it's not a hard set in stone category, it's a rough grouping applied to things that already exist. As alluded to above, it's not really possible to say the process from a given era supports a given level, but as a rough guide, most processes from 2009 onward support V2, and most processes from 2015 onward support V3. V4 is complicated. Intel 11th gen has support, but 12th gen and 13th gen processors do not, and AMD's new Zen 4 microarchitecture adds support. It's hard to know what the future holds for AVX 512, and I'm not going to consider it for the rest of the article. Now, this is what all of this is leading to. Bumping the baseline. It's a trivial change to the packaging of GCC to change the default value, and some distributions have already made this change. Both Rel 9 and SUSE Tumbleweed, as of November 2022, target x86 v 2 These changes have both a cost and a benefit. For users that have hardware that is too old to support V2 instructions, these operating systems will not work at all. For users that have paid for better hardware, these operating systems take better advantage of that hardware. And when we're looking at a system like Rel9 and SUSE Tumbleweed, these are enterprise systems. And this makes sense as a change. For a commercial distribution like RHEL, this probably still makes sense. If you're spending the money to get a RHEL or SLES or any other commercial distribution license, you're probably already running reasonably up-to-date hardware, or at least the additional cost of updating the hardware that is less than 10 years old is fairly insignificant. It is interesting to note that SUSE's new adaptive Linux platform product originally proposed targeting V3 and later, but scaled back to V2. Whilst this article said V4 is where it starts getting weird, V3 is already sketchy enough. But the equation is a little bit different if we're not talking about a commercial distro. For a free distribution like Ubuntu or Fedora or Arch or Gentoo or anything else out there, the calculation is different. Allowing users to extend the life of hardware by installing a free Linux distribution is a significant positive aspect of the open source world, and it is very likely that the users who are still running 2008 era hardware with Ubuntu are the users who are least able to upgrade or in some cases, least willing to upgrade. There are people that are perfectly happy on their 15-year-old ThinkPad and aren't going to change until it literally stops working. That said, hardware doesn't last forever. A few years ago, the cost of maintaining full support for 32-bit x86 machines started to outweigh the benefits and we stopped building most packages. Making a considered decision here requires data, specifically usage. How many Ubuntu users are using hardware that supports only V1 or V2? Secondly, performance. How much performance improvement does changing the default to x86-64 V2 or x86-64 V3 bring anyway? Neither of these questions are easy to answer. Luckily, you can help to answer it. Trying out Ubuntu 23.04 on x86-64 V3 rebuild for yourself. Note, these images are not supported. They will receive no security updates. Do not use them in production. These exist solely for testing and only testing. Do not daily drive them outside of the testing. But if you do want to test this, it should mostly... Heavy emphasis on mostly, mostly work on a CPU that is Intel Haswell or newer, and AMD Excavator or newer. I said mostly twice there for a very good reason, because there are random chips outside of the mainline that don't support things properly. Most of these are like low power Atom chips and things like that. For example, the Tremont line. This launched in 2020 and has absolutely no AVX in sight. If we go back to the previous one, Goldmont Plus, this released in 2017 and has the exact same problem. Let's go back to Goldmont. Once again, no AVX. This released in 2016. Back again to Airmont. And I can probably just keep doing this all day because it's going to have the exact same problem. These low-powered systems often don't have the full feature set. 
you won't be seeing this in most desktops. You won't be seeing this in like a gaming system, for example, but those very entry level gray box systems that you'll see at like an office. They just bought a computer that does computer things. That's where you'll see it. And also these very low power notebooks that are like, you know, two, three hundred dollars that are not intended to be a good device. They're just intended to be a laptop. Now, keep in mind, there are no official plans to move the baseline. It's not like 24.04 is going to ship, and then you have to have a V3 CPU as a minimum. This is just a test to find out what would actually happen. As such, testing is what they did. And this user in here called Arraybolt, who is a developer on Lubuntu, put together an absolutely massive benchmark. This user tested it on two separate systems, a Dell Optiplex 9020 with an Intel Core i5-4570. This is a Haswell CPU. If you went any older, if you went to Ivy Bridge, you would have missed the cutoff. This is the very first generation that we can call V3. The other system is a lot more recent of a laptop. This is running an i5 1135G7. I genuinely hate CPU naming. So this is an 11th gen Tiger Lake CPU. I don't know what this numbering is supposed to mean anymore, but that's what it is. And the benchmark was done with three separate workloads. 7-zip benchmarks, crypt setup benchmarks, and compiling the open JDK 8 source package using dbuild. That would take quite a while, especially on uh, this thing. The former two, these ones here, provided detailed benchmarking info, while the latter, the open JDK build, I timed using sudo time dbuild. I had to use sudo as the package wouldn't build without it, for some reason, these tests were run in a relatively vanilla Ubuntu server installation, a relatively vanilla installation of the test Lunar rebuild, and also my laptop, which had a very special prep done before running the benchmarks. So if you're a nerd and want to go through all of the numbers yourself, feel free to go and do that. I'll leave this all linked in the description down below. Let's just skip down to the conclusion right here. In its current state, the performance of the x86-64 V3 rebuild of Luna in at least the tested workloads is underwhelming. Some slight performance increases were seen in some areas, with some slight and likely negligible decreases in others. More research and testing may be needed for this endeavour to achieve its intended goal of a faster Ubuntu. The first tests are done with the baseline version of Ubuntu, that is set then to 100%, and the numbers you see here are a delta difference between that value. So, whilst you are seeing some improvement in certain cases, and in some cases, you know, fairly big improvements, in a lot of other cases, it's basically the same or slightly worse performance. Here you have the biggest differences, but you are seeing some really big performance degradation as well. Whether that's based on the individual systems being tested or the individual software is kind of unclear. But at least with this one test, it's not entirely clear that doing this is actually a good thing. Obviously, one test isn't enough to make a full conclusion here. But just by the fact that there is a lot of these low-powered systems that do not support V3 whatsoever... It's probably a little soon to move up that high, but you could probably get away with moving up to V2 like is being done on RHEL and SUSE. But what do you think? Are you running hardware that would support this change? Are you running something a little bit older? Or do you think just there's no point even making a change whatsoever, keep Linux as supported as possible? I would love to know. So if you liked the video, go like the video. And if you really liked the video and you want to become a one over, these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon, subscribe, and the pay linked in the description down below. That's going to be it for me, and I know many of you guys run really old ThinkPads, so maybe it is actually going to affect you.